Fantastic. Well, great. Great to be with you. Uh, hey, if you're joining us online, welcome. Uh, my name is Justin, one of the team here, and uh, we're in the middle of a series on sex and sexuality. So nice, nice work. Good week to tune in. If you've not seen Johnny's message, uh, do you know a thing or two that he brought that last week? You need to kind of stop this, go watch that, and then come back. So I'll see you in about 56 minutes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're going to go long again today as well, folks, so brace yourself for that. I've nipped out to the loo. You can't anymore as I've started, but that's all right. As long as I'm comfortable, that doesn't matter. Um, if you weren't here last week, Johnny uh, opened up the series for us, and I just want to give you a quick review of what he brought, and then I'll get into the content for today. Just know that I'm slightly socially awkward, so if at any point during this message you feel awkward, that's okay. You're in my happy place. So um, that's okay, we can just feel awkward together and we'll all be fine. So last week, uh, Johnny brought a message on sex and sexuality. A couple of key points. You know, we, we love people and we love the Bible and you don't have to choose between the two. In fact, those who love the Bible the most should be those who love people the most because that's what the Bible leads us to. Um, so, so that's point number one to grab. Johnny took us back to the garden where uh, God made Eve a suitable helper. Now, helper is not, you know, our helper. It's helper. Eve is described as a suitable helper, and that word help is a military term. It's a term that God applies to himself. It conveys a sense of rescue and salvation and help. So it's not that, you know, our oh, bless Eve was made to kind of tag along. No, Adam needed Eve to be his helper. So there, there's an equality right back from the beginning. Uh, the other thing, though, is that Eve is a suitable helper. So if you, if you go into the Hebrew of that, it's two words, ke meaning like and neged meaning opposite. Eve is a like opposite, a same but different, a next to but against helper. So, so that's kind of the marriage that God sets up between two people who are like each other, but also completely different from each other. And then that thought that two who are the same but different can become one kind of traces through the Bible. So you get to Matthew 19 where Jesus is asked about divorce. And all he needs to say is the two have become one. But what he says is he, before he says that, he goes back into a further text in Genesis and says, do you not know that in the beginning God made them the same but different? Therefore, the two become one. Paul picks up this thought in 1 Corinthians 6. He, he, he pushes it to its final conclusion in Ephesians 5, which is, I'm talking about Jesus and the church. That actually all of this points to two who are the same because one is made in the image of the other, but two who are different because God is so far above humanity and yet at the end of time they come together as one. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, some of the stuff that Johnny ran through last week. And so that leads us then to at Renewal to say, as a Christian community, we would hold what would be known as a traditional sexual ethic, which would reserve sexual activity to the marriage bed of a one man and one woman. And that's where we would say with a traditional sexual ethic that that's why sex is reserved for. Having said that, the other thing that is abundantly clear from Genesis that nobody on either side of the argument will debate with you is this, that everyone is made in the image of God. Amen. Everybody. Those who hold a traditional sexual ethic, those who hold what would be called an affirming sexual ethic, those who don't have any sexual ethic, although I actually think everybody has a sexual ethic, um, but everybody no one person is made less in the image of God than somebody else. And to treat somebody who holds a different belief or a different behavior or a different lifestyle to you, to treat them as less than you is a sin. Because everybody is made in the image of God. So that's a quick review of last week. But here's what I want to say and just, again, affirm everything that Johnny said. You have to do the hard work for yourself. Okay, do not just take what we give you from this platform and go, yeah, now I know what I think about that, off I pop. Because the next time you're confronted with someone who thinks differently or thinks more convincingly, your belief will change. So you need to read, 
and you need to study and you need to read the Bible. And I would suggest you need to read some books and get into the nuts and bolts of this conversation. Like Johnny said last week, People to be Loved by Preston Sprinkle is outstanding. And it's really, really, really accessible. You know some books you have to read with a dictionary? Okay, this is not one of them. It is very accessible. What's brilliant is that he will give you kind of a tour of all the arguments both for and against. Okay, and help you understand that. But again, he would hold a traditional sexual ethic. If you have not read anything on this subject, you need to grab this from the foyer before you go home and have a look at that. If you're a parent or a teenager, Living in a Grey World is also by Preston Sprinkle. Again, highly recommend that you grab that. If you want to know uh, where in terms of culture and our current society sex is at and how we as the church can respond, that's a little bit of what I'm going to do today. But again, I cannot recommend more A Better Story by Glyn Harrison. So if you've not read anything, start with People to be Loved. If you want to ground it a little bit more in our current culture, have a look at A Better Story. There's another book that we can't get hold of for you, but you can find it from your convenient next day online book delivery service. And there's some second-hand copies on there as well, so you can get it slightly reduced. Um, it's a book called Space at the Table. It's Conversations Between an Evangelical Theologian and His Gay Son by Brad and Drew Harper. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult read. Um, I, I cried quite a few times in it, actually. But, but maybe that's you. Maybe you're holding a traditional ethic, but there's somebody in your family who you love who isn't. Or, or maybe... Uh, you're gay and you have parents who are holding a traditional sexual ethic or family members who hold a traditional sexual ethic, what that book will do is just help you see how you can retain relationship and love and respect. It is one of the most honest and yet I think dignified things I've read on this subject. I highly recommend Space at the Table to you. So in light of all of that, my message this week is, so now you know now what? Okay, so now we know, now what? So, okay, so we understand what we believe and why we believe because we've done the hard work ourselves and read the books and thought and prayed and listened to Johnny's sermon again and again and again. So now what? What do we do now? And what I want to say is I want to speak to kind of one particular type of audience today, not to exclude anybody else, but I, I want to be upfront about what I'm doing and help you understand where this is going. So my message is, is kind of for... Christians who hold the traditional view on sexual ethics. That's who I'm speaking to today because that's kind of who we are as a church at Renewal. If that's not you, you are very, very welcome here. But that's who I'm speaking to because the challenge is, so what do we do next? So if that's not you, I hope that something of this message encourages and challenges and you get something from that as well. But um, maybe face-to-face -face conversation is a better way of working your way forward with us here at Renewal. But today I want to speak to those Christians who would hold a traditional view that marriage is reserved for a, sex is reserved for a different sex marriage, man and woman. If we want to hold that, so what do we now do? I want to introduce one thing into this conversation, though, because I've noticed something. So I was at Stratford last week speaking, and then I've caught up with quite a few people uh, who were here uh, at Solid Hole last week and talking to lots of people around the church. And, um, well, this is a big conversation, isn't it? Goodness me, this has provoked a bit of interest. God, I mean, people do listen when we preach. And it feels a bit weighty, doesn't it? And I think that's maybe because you're wanting perhaps one of three things. You're either wanting for us to come out and affirm everything that you've ever believed. Maybe you want us to kind of get with the times and uh, just kind of affirm what current society would say. Or, or maybe you're looking for, you want to kind of hold a traditional view, but you want everybody still to like you and nobody to call you, you know, a bigot or hated. So give us the magic bullet that will get us out of that little nugget. And I want to say whatever you're looking for from this series, our intention is to disappoint everybody. <laughs> Because to come to the Bible and say, I want this to affirm everything I've ever believed, is a terrible way to do your theology. I mean, it, it, your theology should change over the years, by the way. Because yeah. if you still believe everything that you believed in Sunday school, what have you learned about God in the last 30 years? <laughs> c c come on, as we read and as we study, we come to deeper understanding on things. 
So our theology should, should change. However, to come at the Bible and go, I want this to affirm everything that society is saying is good and true, is also a terrible way to do your theology, because it won't. It wasn't written to pacify modern Britain. It was written to transform lives eternally. And to come at the Bible to go, how can I get this so everyone will still like me, again, is a terrible way to do your theology, because the Bible's not written for everybody to like you. In fact, the majority of the New Testament is what do you do when the world hates you because you're a Christian? Okay, so we have to come at the text to go, what is the Bible saying for itself? But there is one thing that the Bible's really clear on, and that's what I want to introduce into this conversation, is hope. It's hope. Like, this is not the conversation in which the church gets marginalized. This is not the conversation in which we lose our right to speak. If we play this right... This is the moment we get to speak even louder about the hope and the fulfillment and the life and the joy that exists in Jesus. Because the more the world tries to find all of those things outside of him, the easier it gets for us to stand up and say, hey, you've tried a whole lot of stuff and you're still not fulfilled. Let me tell you the one relationship you need. Hey, you've got everything you thought you ever wanted and still you want more. That's because there is more. His name is Jesus. Let me tell you about him. This is a really exciting conversation. <sighs> That's okay. I've got 50 minutes left to convince you of that. <laughs> the Bible and the gospel is good news to people of every sexuality and none, of every gender and none, of every lifestyle and those who haven't got a life. The gospel is good, good news. Amen. And that's the gospel that we get to speak into this conversation. By the way, drop the rhetoric that the world is going down the pan. It really winds me up. Ever since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, it has been down the pan. Okay? We will see later there are some things about society's sexual ethic now that are far better than the sexual ethic when the Bible was written. I mean, far, far better. Don't tell me 20 years ago, 30 years ago, everything in Britain was rosy. I will point you to Operation Yew Tree and tell you that everything was not rosy. It may have been in your little world, but, but yeah, sure, some things have changed, and some things have changed for the better in the way we approach sexuality and sexual ethics. So the world is not going down the pan. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. And that is humanity's position, and yet the kingdom of God has been increasing and increasing and increasing. So things will change from decade to decade to decade for sure, some for better, some for worse. But the status has always been the same. We're lost without God, and yet God comes to seek and save us. Okay, so what do we do now? Three things I'm going to give you that we need to do. Number one, can we be honest about sex? Can we be honest about sex? Here is what the world would shout out. Here is what our cultural narrative says. Sex is great. Get some. Just don't hurt anybody. Unless being hurt is your thing. And then, you know, as long as you both agree, go for that as well. That's kind of where sex sits within our society. It's September when I'm doing this, so it's not long before those Christmas perfume commercials are coming on the telly. You know, where they're in their underwear and they spray on the perfume. Do you know, I've sprayed on some of those person perfumes and stood in front of my mirror in my underwear. It don't work. It don't work, I've got to be honest. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I'm grateful for Lynx. I mean, I don't particularly like them and I don't particularly like the smell, but at least the men in those commercials are vaguely realistic. Of course, the only problem is once they've sprayed on really cheap and nasty deodorant, apologies if you love Lynx, uh, once they've sprayed that on, then there's all these gorgeous women falling over them to come at themselves. Yeah, I tried that as a teenager, that don't work either. But that's kind of the narrative, isn't it? You know, that everybody is just having lots of sex and, and having it amazingly. Sex is great. You should just get some. So don't restrict it because it's just amazing. It's all very made in Corinth. It's all very, very made in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 6.12. In this letter, Paul is quoting the church at Corinth back to themselves. So he says, all things are lawful for me. That's what the church have written to him and gone, Paul, chill out. Everything's okay. 
listen, as long as we love each other and we're consenting, everything's lawful. Paul writes back, all things are lawful, you say. Yeah, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me. But Paul says, yeah, but some things that you think are freedom are actually enslaving you. You're not free to drink as much alcohol as you want. You'll be enslaved. You're not free to watch as much pornography as you want. You'll be enslaved. It's the most widely consumed and one of the most dangerous drugs on the planet right now. All things are not helpful. Some things want to enslave you. Corinth as a city was, was rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 44 BC as a, as a Greco-Roman colony. And because of where it was positioned on trade routes, it was a real kind of melting pot, like a real kind of multicultural, uh, multi-religious, pluralistic, everyone with lots of different views on things. It was kind of a bit like our society now, just a real, just a real mishmash of the world coming together in this city called Corinth. Now, the Greco-Roman sexual ethic was far more liberated, I don't think is the right word, because again, I think it's an enslaved, but licentious is you know, not a word we can all kind of grapple with, but listen, anything went in Corinth. What we kind of put on the internet, they would have painted as art and stuck it in front of their dining room. I mean, you would have been eating your dinner, watching explicit, you know, with explicit pictures of sex up on the wall. Anything went in Corinth, and in Corinth, the ethic wasn't sex is great, get some, just don't hurt anyone. Hurting some of that, that wasn't the issue. The ethic in Corinth was sex is great, just make sure you're on top. Uh, I mean, quite literally. So the idea was that you would use sex to increase your social standing. And as long as you played the right role in sex, it didn't matter who you slept with, as long as you came out as the domineering strong one. That was really the ethic in Corinth. You know, they had horrendous practices, like grown men taking boys and teenage boys and leading them into adulthood sexually. And that was just what went on in Corinth. Because as long as you're using sex to increase your power base, you can do whatever you want. Some things aren't as bad as they used to be. Actually, they're a heck of a lot better. Paul goes back and goes, yeah, everything is permissible, but, but some things are enslaving you. Then he quotes them again. They say food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Again, Paul is quoting what they've said to him back. Food meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. What they're saying is, listen, this is just flesh. Like, it's just a fun house. So what's the problem? What, whatever we do with this is just a transaction, food in, food out, sex in, sex out. It just doesn't matter. But Paul's going back to them and going, you've misunderstood who God has created you to be. This thing is not just kind of a pleasure house for you to have as much fun in as you like. That will not lead to your freedom. There is something else. And that's kind of the logic that we have today. As long as you're having fun, as long as no one's getting hurt, what does it matter? Now, we can take on that argument with the Bible, but before we do that, let's take on just that argument with some statistics. Are you ready for some statistics this morning? Yeah. Oh, we love statistics. They're very good. Natsal, the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles. The British National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles are among the largest and most detailed scientific studies of sexual behavior in the world, according to their website. So that's not what me said. We have had three Natsals in this country. Uh, you may have been asked to complete this. Who knows? Natsal 1 was 1990, Natsal 2, 99, Natsal 3, 2010. We are due Natsal 4, and in April, May of this year, they started working on that. Um, you can get the research freely online, but this book, Sex by Numbers, okay, if, you, if statistics turn you on, this is the book you need. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, just don't leave it on your coffee table because I can tell you that gets awkward because people start looking at it and then they look at you and then you're having to explain yourself. No, it's about statistics. Uh, what, what David Spiegelhalter, uh, apologies, David, I've probably just butchered your surname. What he does in this book is like a, a, a big analysis of all the major sexual behavior studies uh, in recent times. He starts off with one study in 1999 where they asked some university students at the, the University of Illinois um, what counts as sexual behavior. 
and a small percentage of gentlemen responded that even penetrative intercourse does not count as having had sex. Gentlemen, if you're watching 20 years later, I hope you found what you're looking for. If you have, could you tell the rest of us? Um, but it's brilliant because he goes into all of the details on our sexual behavior. Let's have a look at some of the results because he highlights this. In that's all one, if we head to the next slide, the average times of sex in a four-week period for a heterosexual was five. In Natsal 2 in 2000, it was four. In Natsal 3 in 2010, it was three. In fact, he goes on to say, if you extrapolate those figures out to 2040, nobody will be having sex. Now, it kind of does it in humor because, of course, people probably will be. But the, the cultural narrative of everybody's doing it, go get some, is not true. We're having less sex than we used to have. In fact, your parents probably had more sex and better sex than you did. So there's a nice thought for you. <laughs> okay, but, but can we be honest? Okay, in the face of a worldview that is telling you everybody but you is having amazing sex, it is not true. The statistics do not bear it out. I was listening to the World Service, because um, yes, I do listen to the World Service. I also have sex. You can do both. Not really at the same time. <laughs> I don't know. Again, depends on what your thing is. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, on the, oh dear. Listen, this ain't the most embarrassing I'm going this morning, all right? So if you were awkward now, it's about to get a whole lot worse. 28th of August this year, you can find it on their podcast app. They did a whole um, documentary, Why Are We Having Less Sex? In every developed nation in the world where we're completely free, where we've thrown off restriction, where we've got all the resources to be whoever we want to be, every nation is having less sex. The cultural narrative is not true. 2014, we're, we're hoping they will do a review, a, a follow-up. But The Guardian rang this headline. The nation has lost some of its sexual swagger. So that was the, the headline in The Guardian because the Observer newspaper had run two surveys, one in 2008 and repeated it then in 2014. And what they found is that in those six years, we had taken a nosedive in self-reported libido, performance, evaluation, and satisfaction of our sex life. In some areas, 30% drop. Actually, we're having less sex. We're less confident about it. We're less satisfied with it. The cultural narrative, it's great, go get some, everyone is. It's not true. You don't even need to believe the Bible. It's not true. Here is my issue, though. If that's what the world says, here is what the church says. Sex is great. Get married. And for goodness sake, don't get caught having sex before you do. It's not good enough. Because our issue is we collude with the world in making sex a God. When that is our narrative, when the moment two people start talking to each other, we're like, oh, when are you getting married? It's because we're too polite to say, please get married and then you can have sex, just don't do it beforehand. But what we do is collude with the world and perpetuate the myth that sex is ultimate and sex is amazing and everybody's having it, so you should get married so you could too. It is not true. We have to have a better response. We have to be honest about sex. According to the Office of National Statistics, 50.5% of our population is married, which means 49.5% aren't. 35% of our population over 16 have never married and never entered into a civil partnership. So it's not enough to say, sex is great, just get married. It ain't going to work for between 30 to 50% of the people that we are coming into contact with. We have to be honest about sex. Because before you get married, particularly if you hold a traditional sexual ethic, you kind of believe that when you get married, it's just going to be this kind of pleasure playground. That all your desires will get met straight away. And you'll never have to kind of manage your sexual temptation anymore because you'll just satisfy it like that. It's not true. It's just not true. Me and Liz, we didn't sleep together before we got married, and then we got married, and we've had some great times in our sex life. 
And we've had some really, really difficult times. Some really difficult times. How do you take the fun out of sex? One step. Schedule it around some ovaries. <sighs> it's that time, dear. I'll be up in a minute. I'm just listening to the world service. <laughs> and after that, I'm going to read the Times Educational Supplement. <laughs> oh. You know, we, I, I mean, we did that for three years. Three years. Some of you are sat here going, yeah, just in three years, you should try 10, 15. <laughs> like, actually, sex can be heartbreaking. Actually, it's not a fulfillment of all of your desires. Actually, it can get really, really difficult. In the middle of that season, I got put on medication, which affected my sexual functioning. The most horrendous time of my life. But we perpetuate this myth. Oh, sex is amazing, so just get married, and then you can have as much as you like whenever you like. You can't. You won't. It can bring great pleasure. It can bring great pain. When, um, when uh, uh, Liz was pregnant with our second child, Charlie, I knew we'd had the conversation that we were going to go for two. I'd just forgotten we'd had the conversation. Now is the moment we're going to go for two. I was like, am I wearing links or something? <laughs> like, what's, what's going on? So that was a bit of a shock when she came out the bathroom with the stick. I was like, oh, yeah, we did have that conversation, didn't we? Okay, here we go. Um, at 16 weeks, we had a follow-up scan, and the consultant said, uh, there's a few issues, no sex. 16 weeks pregnant, no sex. So we'd gone from, let's make a baby sex, although I didn't know it, so you know, I was having a whale of a time, to, hey, we're having a baby sex, to nothing like that. And then 20 weeks, she went into hospital for six weeks and then lay down for the rest of the pregnancy. And you see, before you get married, you think, oh, when I'm married, I won't have to ever put some boundaries around my sexual desire anymore. Finally, I'll just get an outlet where I can just let out and I'll never be subject to temptation. It's nonsense. Like in that period, I had to pull back from so many of my female friends because I was like, I am just wide open right now. This is just a very difficult sexual, emotional, psychological time in my life. When you get married, it's not the answer to everything that you think it will be. And when all we say is, sex is great, get married, we collude with the world's narrative that sex is ultimate. It's not. Nearly every time Paul in the Bible says, hey, you should get married, he also caveats it with, I think you probably shouldn't. So we have to change the narrative and be honest about sex and marriage. It may bring a level of fulfillment to you. It will bring a level of pain as well. <sighs> two things that aren't in heaven and it troubles me. Sleep and sex. And as a, as a parent of young children, it troubles me that it's often a choice between those two things. But sleep and sex aren't in heaven. Now, we, we might be able to nap. It just says there's no night in heaven, so I'm holding out that afternoon naps will exist. <laughs> but there's no point holding out for sex because Jesus says in Matthew 22, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And when we treat sex like it's ultimate, we deny the Bible because it's not. Actually, Jesus says there's something better. Now, when we look at that, we go, well, what could be better than that? Because we buy into the world's narrative that sex is a god and everyone's getting loads. C.S. Lewis says this, like a six-year-old boy who's eating a chocolate bar has no comprehension or should have no comprehension that sex even exists and what it might be like. Like, he will one day find out there is something that will make him drop the chocolate bar and run to the bedroom. One day we will find out that there is something so more fulfilling, so more pleasurable, so more satisfying that we will drop our physical desires and run to Jesus. And we don't understand it now. But we must not believe that sex is ultimate because it is not. There is something far greater coming. Revelation 19, 6 to 8. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. There comes this day where humans who are like God because we're made in the image of God, but we're not like God because he's so far high above us. There comes this day where humans and God come together in intimacy and passion and knowing of one another more than we could ever experience on this earth. And that 
is the day we point to. If sex is ultimate to restrict it is cruel. But if sex is a signpost to something better, then it starts to make sense to say, hey, listen, this will not fulfill you in the way you think it will. Let me tell you of the day that will come. It's Jesus. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Paul, as a Jewish scholar, Paul would know that throughout the Old Testament, to be known was the word used for having sex. And I think there's overtures of this in here. Paul is saying that deep longing that we have to be one with someone else, that deep longing that we have for intimacy and pleasure and relationship, that deep longing that we have to just take our clothes off and be with someone who accepts us, one day that deep longing will get fulfilled when we look into the eyes of Jesus. And until that day, the best sex we'll ever get is a glimpse. And so those who choose to remain celibate and those who enter into marriage to be faithful to one another both get a chance to point at a day where one day we will be fulfilled. But that day is not now. Second point. Can we sort ourselves out? Can we be honest with sex? Can we sort ourselves out? 1 Corinthians 5, 12. What have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? So in Corinth, they've had some sexual immorality in the church. Stuff that even the world in Corinth was think is not on. Which, again, if you've upset the world in Corinth, man, you've gone bad. <laughs> And Paul writes to them to go, listen, I'm not asking you to judge everybody outside the church. I'm asking you to sort yourselves out. What, what is my opinion on the sexual ethic of those who don't follow Jesus? It's none of my business. It is none of my business. It is not my part to judge them or to tell them. Paul is really, really clear. Church at Corinth, you're not to have an opinion on those outside the church Could you sort your own morality out? And if the church in the last 50 years had listened to that, maybe we would have more people in the church. Because we've been found wanting in our own sexual ethic. We've been found wanting in how we handle things like safeguarding. We've been found wanting in this area. When we should have been sorting ourselves out, we've been pointing the finger at the world. And Paul says it's not your job and it's none of your business. In the Gospels, Jesus meets some people who have a different sexual ethic to him. He meets a woman at a well, and he offers her the water of life. She's been married four or five times, and now she's living with someone she's not even married to. And Jesus offers her the water of life. His first concern is not sort out your sexuality. His first concern is let me pour everything into you that you're looking for. There's a woman caught in adultery, dragged before Jesus. And he stands between her and the mob who are ready to kill her. He puts herself in a place of risk. And then he says, well, does anyone condemn you? Then neither do I. But by the way, my church probably will. Go your way and sin no more. There's a prostitute who comes in and anoints Jesus' feet with oil and perfume. And all the religious look around and go, oh, you shouldn't have this kind of person in church. And Jesus says, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. His point is not, she's been forgiven more than you need it, Simon. His point is, you're arrogant and stuck up. And you think that you're better than this person. And he pronounces over her forgiveness, love, faith, and peace. When we encounter people who have a different sexual ethic to the traditional Christian view that we hold... If they are not following Jesus, it's none of our business. Our business is to honor the image of God in them and pour Jesus' love and grace over them. Let's be honest. Let's sort ourselves out. Parents, I might upset you with this, but can I say, I hope you come into our parent workshop, but will you stop worrying about what the teacher's going to do in a 30-minute lesson once a year? Will you start worrying about what's going on in your own home? Because what you model in your own home is what your child will take forward. So how are you modeling love and honor? 
If you're not with the other parent, how are you speaking respectfully and with dignity towards them? How are you prioritizing the house of God and showing them what it means to be part of a Christian community? How are you being open and allowing them to come and talk to you about anything without judging or pushing them away? How are you having different people coming in and out of your house to model the different ways in which you can follow Jesus? Because that's the stuff that matters. I'm not saying don't be interested in what happens at school. I'm just saying if you want to get het up about something, how do you speak to your spouse? How do you speak to your kids? How do you speak to those around you? That is what they are looking for. As Preston Sprinkle points out, if you believe that a traditional Christian sexual ethic is what Jesus wants, then you should be surrounded by people who don't hold that ethic because that's what Jesus did. So actually, to be a Christian holding a traditional sexual ethic means we should know more people who don't hold that ethic than if we didn't because that's what it means to be biblical. Final point. Can we be honest about sex? Can we sort ourselves out? Can we return to the gospel? Okay, let, let me see like I'm deviating away from the subject matter a little bit, but we'll loop back in again. I fear this is what we now believe. As for me and my house, God will serve it. I fear this is what we believe because we pray for a house and a spouse and a car and a job and a career and health. And we, we feel like if we live a good life, then God is just there to fulfill everything that we want him to. But that's not the gospel. That is not it. Matthew 10, 38, Jesus says this, Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We've bought into the I world where everything is about me. And we expect God to fulfill everything that we are looking for and then expect a whole group of people to live in a life of sacrifice to follow him. Ain't going to work. If your marriage is not a place of sacrifice where you serve and give. If your singleness is not a place of freedom but a place of sacrifice where you serve and give. If you are not laying your life down and denying yourself how dare we ask those of a different sexual ethic to do the same? Let me ask you this. Do you think God demands more of anybody? Do you think those who have same-sex attraction or issues with uh, what they feel their gender is, do you think God is asking them to sacrifice more than he's asking you? Because I don't think he is. The issue is we've built a church community in which it's difficult for those people to come into and we've bought into the lie that says God should fulfill everything about me. No, you lose your life. Everybody, everybody is called to lay down their lives. It's difficult to ask other people to if we are not. Derek Prince's book, The Grace of Yielding, in, the, in a chapter denying yourself, he says this, but what is your cross? I heard a fellow preacher say it this way, your cross is where your will and the will of God cross. He goes on to say, your cross is the thing on which you can die. It's the place where you lay down your life. Your cross is the place where you make the decision not to please yourself. Every single one of us is called to radical obedience sacrifice and we have to make sure that we don't build a church community that puts a bigger burden on certain types of people because Jesus doesn't all of us are called to lay down our lives so we come towards a close there's uh, a letter that exists from the first century uh, called the letter to Diognetus it's not it's not in the Bible it sounds a bit like the Bible in certain places but it's it's a disciple of Jesus writing to somebody trying to explain who these Christians are I'm going to read a portion of it to you he says this for the Christians are distinguished from other men neither by country nor language nor customs which they observe for they neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a peculiar form of speech, nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. What he means is they don't have a special club and a special language that only they go to. It's a bit difficult. 
The, the course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men, nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrines. But inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot of each of them has determined, and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They just live like normal people, and yet they live a wonderful, striking form of life. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth is a land of strangers. They marry as do all. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. And here's my challenge with this. I fear we're seeking to not have a common bed, but we don't have a common table in the way we live our lives. I fear we are expecting other people to restrict their sexual practice, but we're not opening up intimacy and relationship and value to them. Two places of intimacy in, in the Bible, really, the bedroom and the table. And the bedroom is restricted, the table is open to all. And so here's, here's our challenge as a church, who can you get around your table? And I don't mean metaphorically. I mean, who are you eating with? Who are you inviting into your world? How are you including people who are different to you into your family and into your life? Because here's the thing, we're struggling to do it as a Christian community. So how are we going to invite those who have no understanding of who Jesus is into the intimacy of our table and eat with them? Because that's what Jesus did. I mean, that's what Jesus was accused of. You eat with everybody. Yeah. Because that's what the church is supposed to do. And we cannot put restrictions around the bed if we refuse to open our table and say, whoever wants to come, come and eat with us. The table is unrestricted. And if we want to hold a traditional Christian ethic where sex is reserved for man and woman in the context of marriage, then we have to open up another intimate space where people can come into our lives, be known, loved, valued, and accepted. You know, sex is not in heaven, but eating is. Eating is. And you know, you're going to share a table with some people. And you know the thing about their sin and their life? Ain't going to be half as bad as yours has been. And yet we're going to sit and dine together. So if you want to reflect heaven on earth, we need an open table where people who look wildly different from you come into your lives and be known. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you love us. God, thank you that none of us were born any worse or any further from you. We have all fallen short of your glory. And yet your cross extends to every single one of us. And God, I pray as we seek to walk out our beliefs in a way that extends your love and your grace to the world around. God, I pray you would help us as we seek to hold the bed as sacred, but the table as open. Lord, would you lead us forward in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you've joined us online and you've made it to the end, thank you. Well done. God bless you. We would love to have you around our table. Come and meet us at any of our locations sometime. Thank you for being with us.